What's good, y'all motherfuckers? It's been a few months, but I'm finally gonna do this vlog review shit. Um, the following game I'm going to review is the titular Zeno Gears, which I've played from September the second all the way through October the third, and it's one of the biggest interruptions to my Romancing Saga 3 LP, which I'm doing here on YouTube for you to see. And it's also, besides the fact that I had to replay Romancing Saga 3, but now that I finally completed that game, I can review it and I can go back to that project 100% this time, for the first time actually. Which I view as fantastic. Now, for the months of 2003 all the way to 2006, I had no idea what was going on with the Final Fantasy franchise, which I grew up with in the PlayStation 1 era, along with the PlayStation 2 era, just 10. Just 10. And for a while, I thought 10 would be bigger than 7, but it played second fiddle. Because there was a time when, in 2002, where you'd go to a game store and you'd ask for 7 and they'd give it to you. We actually went to a game store one time because we wanted to get 7. We lost the disc. The disc we did have was scratched up. And the guy said, no, it's all sold out. What, you said seven? Everyone keeps asking for ten every day. But we have all sorts of sevens, which... That's crazy at the time. But... For a while, from those three years, I had no idea what was going on with Final Fantasy. It wasn't until 2006 where I spoke to a Puerto Rican friend of mine that I realized that 10-2 was an actual thing. I did not know that, and I was left in the dark for a while. So I thought that was kind of crazy. But then I became smart to the internet. But one of the games that I was fixated on in those that brief moment moment of ignorance was Xenosaga. There was Xenosaga episode one, two, and three. And they were all really interesting at the time because they had a sci-fi setting and they borrowed from a lot of weird religious imagery and elements of Gnosticism, which a lot of people say is very pretentious and pseudo-intellectual, but it's just a, it's the equivalent of tech babble. Like, I'd rather hear someone speak about all this weird apostolic stuff than to hear all these random words and letters jumbled together to represent some techno babble. I mean, I'd rather that pretentious shit than the other pretentious shit, the typical sci-fi pretentious shit, which has always turned me off to the genre. I'd like to actually understand what it is that you're speaking about, not just assume it's it's some distant future shit. Uh, you wouldn't understand because we, the author, don't understand either until the spinoffs show up. But, I thought it was cool, all the main characters were really interesting. At the time, I never saw an RPG series where every main character was interesting. That was new to me, because there were seven, and nobody really cared about Cave Sif. Uh, eight. Eight. Towards the end, it was just... Squall, Renoa, and all of people cheering for Squall to get that Renoa. That... Towards the end, they all just became Squall's 
supposed childhood friends that grew up with him in an orphanage. That's about it. Like They themselves were interesting. I really am not concerned with what happens to Selfie many years after the story of Final Fantasy VIII or her individual struggles along with Zell's, even though Zell's a badass. I'm only saying that because I'm concerned for my life. And then there's Nine, which is chock full of meaningless characters. And don't get me wrong, I love Queena. Yes, I actually do love her as a character. But she ain't shit. <laughs> The frog to rock is an awesome move. I probably wouldn't have defeated Ozma without Queena. Garnet slash Dagger is a really cool female protagonist, but a lot of the characters they all have their individual struggles, but some of them are just they're just there because it's a fantasy setting. They're there to fill the setting. With Xenosaga, however, who had Ziggy's individual struggle as a suicidal person who lost his dad in previous life, and the fact that he wants to be machine. All this interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, Junior, and his struggle with Albedo, his other half, that other heartbeat of his. And that's psychopathic badass. And their past is URTVs. The fact that they're anti Udu. Um, Momo and her issue with her dad, Joahim is Rahi, and the fact that her mother hates her because she's really modeled after her dead daughter. And that bothers her. And then there's Shion, the fact that she lost her boyfriend because he was killed by a prototype of the machine she's taking care of right now, Cosmos, and Cosmos, who in actuality is this machine that's programmed to kill these badass noses, and yet. There's more to her than just how she was designed and modeled. She also has these weird abilities and personality glitches where you start to wonder, is she more than just an android without emotion or a soul? Or is there something deeper? And last but not least, my favorite character of them all, if you've seen past videos of mine, Chaos. And the fact that he's this mysterious guy that can, who is seemingly just human, but he can, he never ages. He still looks sixteen. Uh, he can kill noses by touching them, and he's repressing his powers because he's afraid of them. And there's this infatuation with Cosmos, which you, you see all these interesting characters. And this interesting ass setting. What are the Gnosis? Why are they after the Zohar? What is the Zohar? It was a really fantastic story. And then you get to Zeno Gears. And when I found out that Zeno Gears was a thing, I was curious to know more. I actually asked my best friend uh, for a semester in 2008 to actually like, look up some Zeno Gears videos because I really wanted to know how. If it's worth the hype. I've tried watching Let's Plays myself, but a lot of commentators, they never made it all the way through. They weren't consistent with their uploads. They ended up discontinuing. One of the guys actually sounded like me, except he was a total furry. and That was kind of... That was going into a territory I felt was unneeded. And of course, I ended up 
in my senior year of high school finding a Let's Play I liked from Kenshin1913, who I usually watch for his Dragon Quest videos, and I was good. I watched it all the way through, from senior year of high school all the way through now, even though he completed that in the midst of my first semester in my junior year of high school, and I really liked Xenogears, so... In the beginning of this summer, my goal was to get Xenogears first, but instead I got Final Fantasy VIII, Chrono Cross, then I decided to get Xenogears, which I'm glad I did, because playing this game, it was a really fantastic experience. One of the biggest critiques this game would get, aside from Disc 2, is the fact that storyline is pretentious, anime shit, and people are really going to like it for its soundtrack, which, there is some validity in that. The soundtrack from Yasunori Mitsuda makes the game. If you love the soundtrack, you're going to love this game, because... It's a really good soundtrack, and it makes all the scenes look spectacular. But one thing I never see acknowledged is the directing of this game. Tetsuya Takahashi is a really underrated director in the fact that while I love the art style, while I love the soundtrack, The directing is what I think deserves most praise. Because the sprites and the 3D gears and backgrounds, those are all good looking, but they're not going to age well. I actually like the character designs. The character design is going to come back next year to do Xenoblade Chronicles X, but probably my favorite character designer too. But the sprites themselves, these things aren't going to age well. The soundtrack, well, if Yasunori Mitsuda is played out for you or the music is too overly dramatic, you're going to be annoyed. What makes this, what makes the moments in this game so good? is the directing. This is a well-directed game. The camera angles, the scenes, the timing. The timing is key in a lot of these scenes. There are a lot of times where you see close-ups of gears and or you'll get a sudden like panned close-up of a character right before you fight them and there's this feeling of tension like like, there's a predator you're about to fight that's after you and shit. There's a strong feeling that this game is... This game tells its story without the need of good writing. The writing is... It's, it's good, actually. But the directing... I'm not an auteurist. I'm actually against auteurism. I believe that the writer should be main point or main fixture of the writing, not the director. But this game makes me an auteurist for for just a few minutes, just the duration of my playtime, which was eighty something hours, and. Yeah, that's what I think about directing. You already know I think the soundtrack is great, in spite of the fact that there are a lot of places in this game that are in silence. Not as much, not nearly as much as Xenosaga, where it was running on silence. And here we have a variety of fighting themes. There's an actual boss theme. It's not just like 
one fighting theme and then a final boss theme. There's actual boss music. There's this really tense ass song that ends up downgrading into a mini game song. Um, instrumental. That's a bad habit. There's no singing. It's an instrumental. I should I should learn that next time. What else? Well, certain certain scenes they use like theme songs for characters or theme songs for certain moods or just themes themselves, like a theme of the presence of God can be swapped out for the actual boss theme which is Night of Fire and I think that's really cool I like when theme songs are actual songs with a theme instead of just being songs to place hold for a character there's an idea behind the song that's that's really cool Sorry about that. <laughs> She's falling asleep on me. I don't like that. What else? Now, one of the things about this game that separates it from a lot of other games is the fact that there are infantry battles and then there are cavalry battles. By cavalry, I mean you're fighting on your giant robots, which are called gears. Anime mechs. If you've seen a mech anime, you know what I'm speaking about. Fighting on these giant robots that look like soldiers. And you're just kicking ass. Looks really good. And then there's ones where you're on foot, you know, fighting like a standard JRPG. Both of the both of the fights are ATB and they're all set permanently on weight mode. So, it's not like Final Fantasy IV where you're actually like having to switch to these menus quickly and to time yourself because depending on the battle speed, you're really prone to getting attacked by a lot of these web bad guys you're fighting. No, when it's your turn, when the ATB bar fills up, you got all the time in the world to do what you want. The ATB is more for when you're sped up or getting slowed down it plays more of a speed variable than a quick thinking variable which which I like for what they were trying to go for like on foot it doesn't really mean much like yeah if there's a fight where you're in over your head or a lot of your enemies have insta kill attacks you would definitely want the speed advantage, especially if you don't have Satan with you and you have Rico with you. But that's just bad luck. That's just you being an idiot. If you have Rico with you without Satan, those kind of fights they're like Street Fighter. Think about a turn-based Street Fighter because you can do these more like Tekken actually because you can do these large ass combos and they get larger over time in the beginning you can only do three hit combos but later you do combos that spark death blows which takes forever to grind that's gonna be the first problem with this game I mentioned it takes forever to grind these death blows I didn't actually get them all cuz you have to grind them not by actually doing the death blows but by doing specific animations with these moves which takes a long time and you don't really need it for every character because some of them you're just going to use for magic spells but even if you do these moves enough 
you still won't get them until you're at the right levels. Why can't you just get them when you get to that level? I'd rather them do that or just have it be a little more quick and get the move when you do the actual death blow combo. That makes a lot more sense for me. Instead they made it a lot more unnecessary and it was tiresome. Whereas gear battles, you could spark death blows in them, but really with the gear battles, what you're doing most of the time, because there aren't those epic seven hit combos, you're rocking with one through three hit combos, where it's more about hitting an individual button for your turn. There's weak attacks, strong attacks, and fierce attacks which brings up these Beyonce Tyra Banks weird ass terms mixed girl terms <laughs> and when you use these it boosts your attack level and then you can you keep boosting it you can either go into infinity mode which gives you some really powerful combos, or you can do level 1, level 2, or level 3 combos, which deal a lot more damage. But you gotta be smart when you're fighting on your gears, because even your special attacks, especially your special attacks and regular cat attacks, they cost fuel. And for a lot of these fights, because healing costs fuel, you gotta beat them as fast as possible. So you gotta turn your booster on, but when you use your booster, that wastes a lot more fuel. So there is that strategy involved with your gear battles. But my problem with them is that they're usually very easy, especially towards the end of the game where fights are going to be two or three second escapades. Once you get an ether doubler and a couple of E circuits slash power magics, you're set. You could kill most of these guys in one hit without ever having to worry too much. There was only one enemy, and it's an optional enemy that's really difficult, and that's Alpha Weltall, which I actually I defeated him. I actually played this game because I wanted to defeat him too. Because he was the closest thing there to a super boss. And when I think super boss, I think, that's for me, nigga. I want the challenge. I mean, there are the black dragons, but I never bothered because you could kill those in two turns or one turn if you're really good at it. Got the right setup. Most fights in this game are extraordinarily easy to the point that it makes them go from being fun to annoying. Because chores in real life are easy, but they're mundane. People don't like doing them, they hold it back to the last minute. In my middle school days, when there was Whenever we're doing some easy work, we would never get it done because we'd think, this is easy. I could just put this off. Because I'll, I'll get it done, there's no challenge, and you never get it done. It was, we had like classes where there was one paragraph on the board, and we had 45 minutes just to copy that paragraph. That's all we had to do that day. Write the paragraph off the board. It wasn't until high school where I learned from a friend of mine, the way you're going to pass is to copy everything on the board. I don't care if it says fuck on the board. You gotta write fuck. If it says fuck on the board, you gotta write fuck on your notebook. And those were his actual words. They were right. When there's no challenge, things become mundane. 
and it's really up to the game to sell me by the fact that the transition between battles and the actual scenes of the game, they're really good. And as for the actual setting of the game, while it is sci-fi, it's not a space odyssey like Xenosaga. Xenogears is actually told in a planet. We never escaped this planet. We're never in space at any point in this game. Actually, we are near the end traversing through a dimensional rift through space, but that's after the first half of the final boss fight. But other than that, we're stuck on this really interesting planet with speaking animals, ancient cities buried underneath multiple, multiple organized religions, warring countries and empires. And this game really tries to tell you that not everything is in black and white. It's not a very preachy game, which is one of the reasons I almost want to get defensive. Where I could I imagine myself getting defensive if someone says this game is pseudo-intellectual or pseudo-philosophical or pretentious. This game isn't nearly preaching enough to be any of those things. Yes, it's still a square game, which is predicated on heavy narratives, where the bad guy is a bad guy, but why? Because and the good guys are too perfect. But here, that's not even the case. I mean, your main character was technically, spoiler alert, I want you to skip the next 5 to 10 seconds, an assassin. Like, alright, that's kind of a spoiler, but... <laughs> like, these aren't perfect characters. Hold a bad guy towards the end. He doesn't even get his just desserts. He gets everything he wanted, and... For all the horrible things he's done, he's done some things that are really unforgivable. There still is goodness in him. The reasons behind his actions, while stupid, are explainable. So, I'd rather a game borrow a lot of themes. I mean, when I heard about the development behind this game, how it was originally considered a possible Final Fantasy VII, borrowing from themes of Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Freud, and Carl Jung, it sounded really full of pretentious and things of that nature, especially with how edgy the series tries to be, but at least it's edgy without the preachiness. I really felt that this game tried to tell more of an interesting story than just a mundane story with a bunch of interesting images thrown over it. Especially for how weird a game gets in disc 2. The fact that as weird as it got, it kept getting better. That's something that not a lot of RPGs do. I think a lot of turn based RPGs are boring as shit. And this game with the fact that it kind of looked like Grandia slash Lunar Silver stories with a couple of blood in it. That did put me off for a while. But the fact that the game was able to get past that, especially with the fact that it had these cliched anime arcs towards the beginning, like the tournament arc, which I really liked in Blood of Vic. I was really surprised with how great this was. No joke. Like, of course, um... 
I've never actually spoken to you about what the story of this game is. I will say that and I probably won't even. In fact, I'm not, I'm gonna leave the story completely out of this review. I'm just gonna say the soundtrack is great. Gameplay can be a little bit too easy, but it has a lot of good ideas. The game is well directed. The setting is crazy. One thing about the setting I haven't mentioned is the fact that you're traversing this world map, but there are settings like city areas that feel like cities because once you go into them, they have their own individual world maps, which makes this really small planet feel a lot more gigantic especially since there are so many hidden scenes you can find within these cities and all these fun little glitches and character interactions and interplays that it makes the first disc really interesting hell even the second disc towards the end when you're finally free is really good but now I gotta speak about the problems. One of the problems is the fact that this game is too. Besides. It's a disc 2. It's definitely disc 2. While the first game had you break away from your initial freedom, the second disc was you pretty much spamming the confirm button to go through these hour-long conversations and there's no longer great directing because there was no longer a lot of scenes it was just a lot of dialogue a lot of pseudo philosophical writing some of the character development started to get really strange especially for one of your more important characters Ellie in disc one she was a officer from a really nice family in Solaris so an empire that pretty much dominates the world so she's the normal privileged girl that got her way to the top because of her dad and instead of being a snob about it she's really a humble person a she feels like she doesn't have a lot of freedom, that she can't do what she wants, she can't be herself, she doesn't know who she is, and she relates to character Faye because she feels like Faye is in a similar situation, and of course they've known each other throughout the duration of their lives because of their past lives. But we don't know this yet. It's hinted at it. That's why I don't feel bad for spoiling it. But you see all this stuff, and it's really interesting. And then in this too, she turns into the Virgin Mary out of the blue. Like the character switch is so jarring. I don't even get it. I mean. Faye stays consistent, but a lot of characters just don't stay consistent. To once this two starts, a lot of things just like happen all at once. It becomes really abrupt, and for a game that loves its exposition, this game loves exposition. Like thirty minutes of exposition, and then a boss battle. That's this two right there. 40 minutes of exposition, an hour of exposition that you're forced to watch, and then a boss battle. But it gets really bad when it turns abrupt, when it stops telling you all these things. Because then you're like, bruh. The fuck? Platforming in this game is also a bit of a problem. I found myself. <laughs> I mean, it's a thing a lot of people complain when a game tries to take on elements 
outside of its genre, because then it loses positives on both. But I actually like the platforming in this game, in spite of the fact that the random battles and the counter rate kind of fucked up with it. Because it made the level designs a lot more interesting, seeing as you didn't have to have like 50 staircases for some of these towers and these dungeons. You could really be creative with level designing and shit. You weren't chained to the mundane, and that really matters. To me, it does. Cause this shit could be OD. What else? One of the worst things this game does, the worst crime this game did, and it wasn't even this too, it was the fact that this game had its main, one of the best characters ever vanish. This is really the only valid critique I have with this game. Well, there's actually another one. A lot of characters in this game don't have weapons. Um, there's only uh, four characters in this game that have weapons and use them and only three are going to be in your final party and there are two characters that don't have weapons I mean don't have death blow it's outside of their gears and one that doesn't even have one with them in her gear I said her, so you could already narrow it down. And she's absolutely useless unless you customize yourself really well or customize her really well. But that's just nitpicking. So I'm not even going to let that count. Because I really like customizing people with nice ass weapons. Now, one of the unforgivable ones, and this is going to close out my review, they got one character most badass character in this once this two starts they don't exist anymore like they vanish you can only see this character in its giant robot form in the battles that's it I'm gonna spoil it straight out for you it's it's Jesse Josiah he doesn't die in the previous area before the disc ends, because you see him afterwards getting into some neato conversations. No, the most badass character of the series, not even it. This guy makes it look like a pushover. Not Satan. Not any of these characters. Jesse. What happened to Jesse? Did they forget this guy? Did they spend so much money making this guy badass that they couldn't do it because of time constraints or the budget? I think it's mostly time constraints. What they were they used to like spend like fifty hours coming up with all the badass shit that he would say and do and just his demeanor. That they're like, nah, let's 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 cut this. It's taking too much time. You couldn't even have him just in the background in some rooms just being himself just chilling like a G it's Josiah Jesse he's one of the greatest characters oh he's almost as badass he's more badass than Big Joe of course Big Joe is comic relief and Big Joe is the other guy let me fuck this shit up and just go to all, like, the stupid shit. Big Joe is awesome because no matter where you are, what arc you are in this game, he's always going to appear doing some inane shit while you're in prison, you know, trapped in that, like, a uh, prison arc, D-block. Oh, uh, religious facility is getting raided. You're in a 
city with slave labor where if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you'll get beamed out of existence. He's gonna be there, just doing comic relief shit. This guy... This guy is badass. I'm glad that they didn't accidentally forget about him the way they did with Josiah, because then... Then this game wouldn't be good. This game would've fucked up. But, no. It didn't. They didn't fuck up with this guy. I definitely didn't fuck up with uh, one of my favorite boss battles in disc 1, which was against Ed. They did so many things right in this game. But it, the fact that... I don't care, I don't care what time constraints there were. You didn't have Jesse in the cut? That's unforgivable. That's the only reason this game isn't going to get like an 11 out of 10 in my book. If I was going to rate it with a number. But would I recommend you guys play this game? If you're a retro gamer. Do you like PlayStation 1 RPGs? Yes, I would recommend it. But if it's not. And you don't really have an appreciation for good music and video games then I really wouldn't recommend any of the games I've played to you because oh well, you probably wouldn't have an appreciation for it unless you developed it while playing this game if you think you'll have an open mind and that an open heart too, which is even more important, that you'll actually develop a more keen interest in these kind of things, then definitely you should consider it. But if you're going to go in ready to analyze it and nothing else, then it probably isn't for you. For me, this is a classic. A lot of people say it's not going to age well. Mm. No, it aged wonderfully. Even with my initial skepticism and how I was initially going to go into this thinking, well, no, nah, this, this is that boring JRPG shit, that wax headed JRPG fence. No, this is most definitely on the good side, and I'm glad that I touched on it. And I'm glad that I'm done with it, because now I can complete Romantic Saga 3, which, that's going to be a forever and a half. Anyway, this is Mr. Monka 7. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Yannick is going to suck my dick. I'm out. I've been speaking for 43 minutes. Wow.